So, um, my name is Chuck Tuffley. I'm a FreeBSD developer, and I'm going to talk about some work I've done uh, called Frankenstein's Disk Drive. Now, why Frankenstein's Disk Drive? Partly because a framework for user-defined drive behavior via the hypervisor's emulated device was too many words to fit on this slide. But more, I wanted you to have a particular picture in your head. OK, so not quite this picture. But what I wanted you to picture was taking a totally normal thing, this, this perfectly functioning drive, and adding parts and pieces to it until it behaved the way you want when you wanted it to. And unlike Dr. Frankenstein, in most cases, we actually are trying to create a monster. OK, so why would you want to modify a perfectly good device? So I develop uh, NVMe devices and software. And so when I saw this tweet, it kind of piqued my curiosity, because this isn't an error I had seen or experienced before. And I kind of wondered if the FreeBSD NVMe driver or some of the file systems that sit on top of it were having a problem with it. And because I couldn't get access to this system or the device in question, the question was how to investigate this. And so before we get too far down the path, we're going to be talking about lots of bugs and failures. And this is not a criticism in any way of any of these pieces of software. Bugs are a totally normal part of this process. And everything in this talk handled my views fairly well. So the question is, how do you test device drivers or system software in that case? Because they are slightly different. So when you test other normal pieces of software, you can do things like have unit tests. And so in this case, the testing methodology would look something like, give it some good input, give it some bad input, give it some random input. And this actually works fairly well because you control both the code and the stimulus. But with drivers, you don't entirely control the stimulus. So what do you do? Testing the good pieces is very easy because everybody wants stuff to work. And it's, it's really testing the error path that's the hard part. Now, you'll see errors in the normal course of development. But they're somewhat random and sporadic. And, and what you're actually asking is, how do I get this hardware to misbehave in predictable and reliable ways? All while the hardware team's goal is to have absolutely no errors. So the two of you aren't going to get along. So the way that most driver code handles this is a couple of ways. The most common way is you'll have your driver plus kind of this error mode. And in this error mode, that gets invoked various different ways depending on the driver. There are certain kind of canned failures that happen. So you'll do things like uh, you'll return a bad status just because. Um, you'll pretend to submit an I.O. and actually not, and watch it time out. Uh, you'll immediately abort an I.O. that you submitted, things like that. And while this is actually better than nothing, it has a bunch of problems. So, the first thing is it's fairly dangerous. I mean, you have the equivalent of unexploded ordnance in production code, and you're one straight pointer away from exploding it. True story. Um, also, this tends to, the, the number of modes that you have and the types of failures tend to be fairly static. So there's kind of only a limited amount you can do. And it, it tends to be. Implementing these tend to be hard because you're in the kernel mode, and, and it's, that's just it's a super constrained environment for very good reasons. But it, it tends to make this sort of thing harder to do. But when you think about what the driver's trying to do and what this error mode is trying to do, they're really working at cross purposes. So you have your driver code that's trying to protect the user and operating system from batshit crazy hardware, and you're trying to protect fragile hardware from batshit crazy users and the OS, all 
while trying to not do that and break that. So it, it, it tends to be very painful. The other approach that, that people have used, and, and Intel actually had a really good talk about this yesterday, is you kind of create these mock interfaces to your driver. So with a mock interface, you're pulling your code out of the kernel, and you're creating uh, interfaces that mock the hardware and the operating system. And in this way, you can actually control the stimulus that's coming from both sides. But the problem with that is the environment is different. I mean, it's only as good as your emulation of the, the hardware and your emulation of the, the OS. And kind of in the limit, you're recreating both perfectly. So the alternative that, that I've poked around with is actually building virtual hardware with customized firmware. And so what this looks like is a Beehive emulated device with some user-defined plugins. Um, and for this, I used the specific example of an NVMe device, although there's nothing super specific to some of this framework for NVMe. So we'll talk a little bit about the NVMe and the, the experimental uh, framework. So for those of you who haven't heard of it, Beehive is a hypervisor that was developed on FreeBSD to run virtual machines. And it takes advantage of the hardware virtualization features of the chipset, and for the most part runs in kernel space. But it actually does emulate some devices, and this is mostly for OS compatibility reasons. And this is kind of our virtual hardware. And so the way this works is when you're running in kernel space, when a guest accesses um, memory to one of these uh, emulated devices, it causes a VM exit or exiting from this. Uh, from the virtual machine. So in our example, this would be something like accessing the NVMe registers, memory mapped registers. So, that, so then, at this point, Beehive will then handle these device accesses in user space. And this kind of forms the basis for our customized firmware. Okay. So since we're going to be talking a lot about NVMe, I thought it would be kind of useful to do a, it's not going to feel brief, but a brief walkthrough of NVMe, just to give you a better context of how some of these pieces are going to work. So NVMe is a storage standard that defines both the hardware interface and the command set. Um, and while there are multiple ways to connect the host and an NVMe drive, I'm only going to focus on the PCI Express part, since that's what Beehive implements. And one of the reasons that NVMe has become popular recently is because of its high performance. And it gets this high performance because it was defined, designed for multiprocessor systems. And when you look at what the traditional speed bumps are for drivers, storage drivers specifically, the two big hits are lock contention to hardware resources and register accesses. And NVMe's weapon of choice in dealing with this are queues. So the goal here is to efficiently pass messages between the host software, the driver, and um, the device. And NVMe does this with a variant called producer-consumer queues. So one side will produce messages for the other side to consume. So these queues have two components. So there's an array of messages in host memory, and then there's a pair of registers called the head and tail pointer registers. And the basic mechanism is the producer will produce to the location pointed to by the tail pointer register, and the consumer will consume from the uh, location pointed by the head pointer register. And you know what to do when those two register values don't match. So as we said, there, there was one side produces and the other side consumes. So if you want the hardware and the software to talk with each other, you're typically going to allocate these in pairs. So the host is going to submit or produce uh, commands on the submission queue. And the host is going to consume or process completions from the completion queue. And typically, you'll get 
And since the specification allows over 65,000 queues, queue pairs, typically what host software will do will be to allocate a queue pair per CPU core. And this avoids your, most of your lock contention. All right, so we've talked about these queues. Let's look at how we would create them. And part of this is because all NVMe commands follow kind of this, this same rough format. So each command itself is an array of 32-bit values. The spec refers to as D words. Damn you, Microsoft. Um, so the first D word is going to specify which operation to perform because it has this field in it called the opcode. Um, then there's going to be a common location for uh, a host memory address if that's needed by the command. And finally, you'll have uh, kind of command-specific parameters that, that come after that. So to create a completion queue, we're going to specify the create CQ opcode in that first D word. We're going to allocate some host memory for the completion queue for those messages. Um, we'll then tell the device how many entries there are, aka the size, and then we're going to pick a name for this, this queue, also referred to as the queue ID. Now, the queue ID also determines which um, head pointer register you're going to use for this queue. And then it has a little bit of information about which interrupt to use. The submission queue follows a very similar pattern. So we're going to specify the create SQ opcode in the first D word. We're going to allocate some memory for the queue, uh, specify the size, pick a name. And then for the submission queue, we need to determine where those completions are going to go. So we'll actually include the submission, the completion queue ID that matches the one that we, we previously allocated. OK. So now that we have both of these queues, let's look at an example of how they get used. So here we have a, um, a queue pair between the host and driver with a, the associated registers. Now the top registers are owned by the host and are what we're going to be looking at a little bit. The bottom conceptually exists. They may or may not kind of depending on the implementation. But for this purposes, we'll, we'll pretend they really do. OK, so when the host wants to send a command, it's going to fill out a submission queue entry. And this is going to include the type of operation, like read or write, that sort of thing. There'll be a name for that command, so the command ID, similar to your queue IDs. And then a bunch of operation-specific detail. What's the starting logical block address of the operation, how many blocks, et cetera. Once it writes that to the queue, it's going to increment the tail pointer register. And it's this uh, register update that tells the device that there's work to do. So now that the device knows that there's work to do, it's going to fetch the entry. It's going to process the command that the host has given it. And that includes transferring any data associated with this command. Once the command, it's done processing the command, it's going to fill out a completion queue entry and write that back to the host memory. And this is going to include the status of the command. Did it succeed or did it fail and why? And it will also include the command ID that we submitted it with. And because it includes the command ID, this allows the drive to reorder commands for its own efficiency. So then the host can process the completion. It's going to increment the completion queue head pointer. And this is going to tell the device that there is now room for it to write more completion queue entries in the completion queue. And we're done. We're back to two empty queues. Beautiful. Now, this kind of glosses over how the host knows to process the completion queue. But for these purposes, that, that doesn't really matter. Now, the thing to notice from this walkthrough is there's kind of some similarity to risk. So in a classic risk CPU pipeline, you're going to do things like you have an instruction fetch stage. And you're going to have an instruction decode stage. You're going to execute the instruction memory accesses. 
and then you're going to write back the results. So when we look at it, this from the NVMe controller, or the, the, the drive's point of view, it looks very similar. So we're going to fetch the submission queue entry. We're going to decode the opcode. We're going to execute the operation, and then we're going to write back the results to the completion queue. And by giving the plugin access to each of these stages, we can customize what the firmware is doing, and thus the drive's behavior. So what are these, how do these plugins work? Well, they take an approach that's very similar to DTrace's static, um, statically defined trace points, meaning that there is a predefined tap or tap point at each of these stages in the NVMe emulation. And at each of these stages, the user can run code that they've given to, uh, to Beehive. And in this way, there's no need to modify Beehive itself to change the drive's behavior. So this plugin gets provided to Beehive via a shared library or a .so. And part of the motivation for doing that was to entirely sidestep the question of what shiny pretty scripting language should I use for this and just kind of get down to the basics. But it also doesn't preclude doing something like linking it with the Lua interpreter or something else um, if that becomes a, a good way to um, make scripting these things easier. OK, so now that we have this, how do we refer to each of these tap points? And it's, it's kind of a string that we're referring to them, and it has a tuple. So the first component of this tuple is the module. And for my work, I implemented uh, NVMe and PCI, but you could easily imagine doing this for other things. Uh, the next stage is the component, or the next part is the component. So this tells you, am I working on an admin queue, an IO queue, because they can have similar named um, uh, stages. Um, and the, the last is the stage. And this kind of mirrors the, the stages of the pipeline that we were just talking about. So then Beehive itself is going to expect each of these plugins to provide a setup and teardown function. And these kind of do what you would expect. So the setup function is going to get called when the module gets, the plugin gets loaded, and the teardown will get called when the uh, plugin is unloaded. And then it's going to provide a way for the user to attach and detach callback functions to each of these tap points. So here you can see we have the Beehive uh, code or the Beehive functions to a tap and detach taps. We used a macro to declare our callback function, call that in command. And then in our setup function, we call plugin tap attach with a tuple for NVMe admin decode, and that will run our function when that tap gets hit. Okay, so then internally to Beehive, um, the TAP uses a mechanism called linker sets. And this is an approach used all over the operating system to group kind of group objects into special sections of either the executable or, or the module. And it really, most, it does some other stuff, but it mostly simplifies the mechanism for registering these objects. And once you have all of these objects in a nice set, it's very easy to search for them to say, oh, hey, do you have a tap called this? So here we have the tap for um, the NVMe admin decode stage. So we've declared the, the tap um, structure at the top. Uh, it has a name that matches the tuple. It has a function pointer for the callback provided by the user and a way to specify whether it's enabled or disabled. And then in the uh, NVMe code that handles the admin command, you can see it's grabbing a submission queue entry, and then it looks to see if that tap is enabled. If it is enabled, it's going to uh, invoke that callback function that the user has provided, and it's going to pass it some information. So the first thing is the, uh, the BDF, which is PCI speak for bus device function. Pass it to a uh, pointer to the command that the host submitted, 
a pointer to the completion queue entry, and then that last entry happens to be the uh, queue ID. Okay, so now we know how the plugins work, how they're built. Um, so how how does this apply to the uh, to the original thesis? So for this read-only failure, we were provided kind of a general description of what happened and some log excerpts. So the setup was a FreeBSD 12 system, and it was serving ZVols over iSCSI with a slog on an NVMe device. And the NVMe device is report or the NVMe driver was reporting that it was in, the device was in a read-only mode. So what does this mean? The way most NVMe and flash devices for that matter work is if you want to write to a block of flash, that block has to have previously been erased. And to complicate matters, those blocks can only be erased a fixed number of times. So after you eventually run out of erase cycles, you end up with a device that can only be read. This is the, the log excerpt that we got, kind of lightly sanitized. And so you can see the NVMe driver up there reporting an async event. So what the heck is this? This is actually an NVMe asynchronous event notification. This is a mechanism that the uh, spec uses to communicate events that are outside the context of a particular command. Now, while Beehive doesn't implement asynchronous event notifications or requests yet, um, this is actually okay because the FreeBSD driver doesn't actually do anything with them other than report that it got them. Now, the one note, odd thing about this excerpt that we got was there were no actual errors. So no IOs had actually are being reported here as fail, which I found weird. But anyway, so getting ahead of myself. So assuming that that log message is what's going on, how are we going to implement this? So this is actually the entire plugin uh, minus the pounding clues because those don't really matter. And the, the, the philosophy here, or the theory here, was after some number of writes, just return a good status. Don't actually do the data transfer. So uh, we declare our callback function up at the top. We're going to call plugin tap attach to attach it to the NVMe IO decode tap. And then we have this number of writes that we're going to fail after. So we're going to fail after 5,000 writes. Why 5,000? Why not? You need some number. And then this is our callback function. So it's going to look at the command that's passed in. If the opcode says this is a write, it's going to decrement that number of writes. And when that gets to zero, we're going to just return a good status in the completion queue entry. Now that return one at the bottom is significant in that it says, hey, I've actually handled this command. You don't need to do anything else. And that allows us to not do any of the actual data transfer. So that's great. So we compile the so you compile the plugin, you pass this to Beehive on the command line, you fire up some synchronous writes to your Zvol, and nothing happens. Everything is fine, no failures, crap. So you go, okay, fine. Maybe the problem was there actually were errored IOs, but they either got missed when they were reported to us or something. So we took basically that same plugin, and instead of returning, um, silently discarding the, the IO or the, the data, we're going to change this to an explicit error. And for me, the one that made sense was attempted write to read only page, which is kind of what's going on. So same sort of thing. Compile the plugin, pass it to Beehive, fire everything up, do some synchronous writes to your, your Zvol, and ta-da! Yay, now the NVMe driver is complaining. So you can see these are failed bios at the top, and it's saying write to a read-only page. Cool, that's what we wanted. 
And then actually, ZFS eventually gets grumpy with us and it faults the drive because there are too many errors. Hey, we did exactly what we wanted. This is awesome. And there was no system hacking. System behaved perfectly fine. Um, this was terrible. So you go, okay, that didn't work. Well, maybe the fact that we were picking a fixed point at which to start failing the IOs, maybe that was the problem. So you go, okay, we'll, we'll change the plugin around. So instead of failing exactly at 5,000 writes, we will randomly, after some number of writes, say, hey, we're read only. Same, number, same thing, compile it, load it up, do your synchronous writes. No, this was fine too. Same as the previous results, drive errors, ZFS gets grumpy, and offlines, and offlines it. But the system stays up and keeps working fine. Okay, um, what if it wasn't a permanent death? What if the drive wasn't quite dead? What if it wasn't dead dead? So uh, we went back to kind of one of the previous iterations, and instead of Stopping once you we got to our, our number of failed IOs, we said, okay, well, we'll return another 10 IOs because reasons, and then we'll reset the counter. And this has the effect of the drive working nicely, failing 10 IOs, and then going back to working nicely again. So this, this sounded devious. But no, same, same, same exact results as, as all the other tests. And so from a, this was kind of a mixed bag. So from a guy who's trying to go break something, this was very disappointing. From a person that's responsible for the care and feedings of part of this OS, that was kind of awesome. And so the, and the thing to note here is that while I wasn't able to exactly reproduce the error, we just covered four different test cases, four different ways that the, the, the OS could have failed, and we now know won't fail because we were able to test it. <clears throat> okay, so we've shown how we can use the uh, plugin for error injection, but when I talked about this at the beginning, I, I talked about um, behavior modification. So one of the ways you could modify the behavior is by adding new behavior. So let's do that. Oh, Lord. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the NVMe controller to perform computation. Now, this was inspired from a presentation at the annual NVMe meeting, and while I haven't entirely wrapped my head around why this is a good idea, I've decided to completely embrace it, and we now have the first shipping implementation of NVMe Compute. So. What we're going to do is we're going to steal one of the vendor-specific opcodes, in this case, 80, because it's the first one, and that's easy. And we're going to define that as the sum operation. And so the way this, this our new command will work is it'll take the value from command D word 10 and the value from command D word 11, add them together, and stick them in the uh, command D word 0 of the completion. So you can see we. Uh, we register our, our uh, callback. If it matches our opcode of 80, we add up 10 and 11, dutifully put the sum in, in D word 0, set a good status, and say we're done. And then this add program at the bottom basically formats this command, puts the, the command line arguments in command D word 10 and 11, and then prints out uh, D word 0 of the completion. You can see when you send that to and being zero, it now yeah, correctly adds up 10 and 5 and comes up with 15. And so while this is a super, super silly example, I'm sure you can imagine how this could be used to prototype other new features. OK, so now we've seen a, an example of doing something destructive and a, an example of doing something constructive. So now I will give you an example of doing nothing. So when you're debugging hardware, sometimes you're going to use a thing called a protocol analyzer. 
And this is a device that sits between the host software and the target of what you're looking at and records everything that goes between the two of them. And this is useful for debugging issues and looking at performance kinds of problems. And so when we, we think about our plugin framework, it's exposing state at each stage of the NVMe pipeline. And so we can actually write a plugin that records the state and acts as sort of a protocol analyzer for an NVMe device. The plugin doesn't fit on one screen, so, but this will give you the general idea. So what you see here at the bottom is we're registering a callback function for each of the stages that we um, have defined in the, in the framework. So this is going to be for PCI and NVMe register accesses, admin and I.O. commands, admin and I.O. completions, and some interrupts sprinkled in just because. Now, each of these callback functions is going to save their state-specific information for what I call trace events in a buffer that we're allocating up at the, at the top. And when the plugin closes down, we're going to write all those results out to the TAMP trace file. And when you do that, you get something that looks, oh, lost my colors. Um, when you uh, do it, you get something that looks like this. So what, what I used this for was to debug why OpenBSD was hanging when it was past a NVMe device in Beehive. So uh, we're, you're looking at the very end of the trace, and kind of the general format is you have the trace index, uh, the time at which the event was taken, uh, the PCI address of the device in, in, in question, and then some of the event-specific information. And when you look at it, you can see that we're doing some register accesses to enable the device. We pass some admin commands, and those are completed. Identify, create some queues, get an identify. And then down here at the bottom, it issues a read command to which the drive gives it a completion. And then there's nothing. Now, normally at this point, you would expect to see the host update the completion queue, doorbell register, say, hey, I got this I.O. and process it, and you might even see an interrupt, but there's nothing. And actually, this sort of is a missing interrupt problem after a fashion. So what's going on here is NVMe requires devices to implement MSIX interrupts, and it allows them to implement MSI interrupts. Most real devices do actually implement both. OpenBSD did not implement MSI X interrupt support for their driver and only implemented MSI. So while they were waiting for an interrupt that would never happen. Now, when you go in and, and it was a all of one line change to fix the, or change the OpenBSD driver, uh, everything worked just fine. So, I know what you're thinking. I mean, Chuck, this is great and all, but I didn't drag myself all the way to Canada to look at your silly text output. And while that's honestly a little hurtful and harsh, you're absolutely right. So what we have here is uh, Wireshark decoding uh, NVMe traffic from Beehive. So Wireshark is a network protocol analyzer. And I picked this one because it actually had a, a NVMe dissector or packet decoder already for NVMe over fabrics. NVMe over fabrics is just a way to pass NVMe commands over a fiber channel or, or Ethernet. And the, the thing to note here is this isn't just wrapping a pretty GUI around the previous output. So while I did start with the previous plugin, I ripped out all of my code that wrote to this ring buffer of events and actually substituted in libpcap. Uh, pcap is a portable C++ C++ library for network traffic capture. Then I invented a uh, NVMe over Beehive protocol. And in less than an hour, I was able to save traces in libpcap format from Beehive. Now, uh, why libpcap? That's something that Wireshark knows how to ingest. 
So while that was quick, it took most of the rest of the day to figure out the ins and outs of, of Wireshark and how to convince it to import this. But the point here is I was actually able to rapidly and easily leverage these user space tools and actually come up with an analyzer that was much, much better than what I had started with. I mean, so this has searching and filtering and analysis all for free and decodes. I didn't have to do any of that. that this is awesome. And I could even take it another step further and implement things like their, uh, their live packet capture and the other sophistications. Playback? No, that doesn't exist. Um, now, could I have done this in the kernel? Sure, but oof, that would be hard. And it wouldn't have taken me a day. It would have taken much longer. Um, so, uh, so what is this protocol? It's actually sort of, of an adaptation of the previous uh, trace entries that we were looking at in the original. Um, and you can kind of see it up here. So it, uh, you have a timestamp, you have the record type. So here we have a memory register read, gives you the PCI information, the size of the register access. And then we can see that we're reading the submission view two tail doorbell register and we're we got that value of hex 2.1. Yeah. And then for people that haven't seen uh, Wireshark before, the column on the left is all of the packets that are in the trace, and the window on the right is the decode of them. So then walking through that, after that uh, submission key, uh, doorbell right, we can see that we got a command, and it's showing that this is a write command, it's going to namespace one. It's starting at logical block uh, x2000, and it's eight blocks long. The drive is OK with that. It, passes, it has a uh, command status of all zeros, which means the command was successful. Uh, you can see that we get the uh, head pointer back from the drive's point of view, and since this is the same value that the device, the host passed in, we know that the queue is now empty. And we can see the command ID. And lastly, we have the host writing the completion queue to head doorbell register, indicating that it's actually processed that completion. So, that's kind of the current state of things. What's next? Um, probably the main thing is a lot of bug fixing. The initial NVMe emulation was a Google Summer of Code program, and it missed a couple of things. So there's a lot of missing functionality from a to make this look like an actual real NVMe device. Um, the other thought was that it would probably be good to give this access to data and not just the commands. Uh, there's a little bit of a complication in this in that NVMe specifies things in pages, and those pages can be discontiguous. So there's a question of do you pass this on to the plugins, or do you somehow stitch this together in some sort of nice virtual contiguous space? The other thing that would be good and that I think will be actually really interesting is adding some asynchronous to it. Um, so currently, everything inside the emulation pretty much handles things in line. So it gets a command. It's pretty much going to process it and give you the completion all in the same context. So by adding some asynchrony, asynchronity to it, I can do things like actually implement these asynchronous event notifications. But with that, I can also do other interesting things, like we can actually delay IOs. So you could say, for 2% of the right IOs, delay them by a millisecond to see what kind of effect that has on your workloads. You can do other things, like you could quarantine IOs and make sure that your abort processing actually works, because that IO is being held, and you know it's being held. And the other thing that this, this introduces is the possibility for plugins to inject events into Beehive itself. So these events would be 
things that wouldn't be triggered by IOs. So if you wanted to say, hey, the drive is now over temperature, um, this would trigger asynchronous event notifications, and you could check that, for example, your smart logging picked up that error. Um, and you could also do things like you could, you could send an event that said, hey, I'm out of erasable flash. Now, this sounds a lot like the original plugin that we created, but there's actually sort of some benefits to it. So by injecting this event into the Beehive framework, you would also trigger an asynchronous event notification that matched what we saw on the, the provided log. And you would actually kick Beehive into returning writes with an error. So this would mean that your plugin was actually a lot smaller than the example that we showed, you know, kind of making it easier to write plugins. The other thing that, that I think needs to get looked at is sort of some safety issues. Now, we're giving plugins unfettered access to raw memory. And either this is the worst idea ever, or this is a cost of doing business. I don't know. That's something that needs to get sorted out. And you also run into issues of, well, what happens if a plugin goes into an infinite loop? You've now hung your, your beehive process. So how do you mitigate stuff like that? And finally, what sort of what sort of things would you features would you like to see in it that make it useful to you? That's all I have. Questions? Yeah, any other guesses on what happened with the MDB drive that returned the system? Uh, the question was, do I have any other guesses as to what happened to that system that perturbed it? Uh, I think it was something else. My guess is it was something that was actually unreported. Um, after poking at the slog as long as I did, I'm guessing that it had nothing to do with it, and that was just a, a canary. What uh, it, version of the host OS did you use? Uh, I tried both. What versions of the host OS did I try? It was both 11.2 and 12. I think Jen appears older than that. Well, the Jason is in there. So, don't, don't have a good idea. Have you got any thoughts of applying the same techniques to the AHCI model with the Beehive? Um, yeah, this could. Uh, the question was have I uh, considered applying this to uh, things like the HCI? Um, I think it absolutely could. Uh, looking at the examples of you know where all this started from, do you think if you had had that NVMe drive, you could have passed it through and used the Wirecard plugin to pretty easily figure out what had gone on? So the, the question was, if I had had access to the drive that failed, um, could I have passed that through to Beehive and used the uh, Wireshark plugin to figure out what was going on? So, so there are actually two parts to that. Um, if I had access to the drive, I would have had it in an already access to it in an already failed state, which may not have given me the, the trigger point. The other thing to note is that passing through a physical device doesn't give the emulation any visibility into what's going on. So, so all of the tap points that we were talking about don't exist for the physical hardware. It's only when you're using the emulated hardware. Use maybe a dummy device that uh, serves only to capture the events in an actual physical place? Uh, the question was could I sort of proxy the commands that were coming in to a physical device? And yes, I think that, that would work. But then you get back to the device is already in a failed state, and that may or may not let you. Uh, as a diagnostic. As a diagnostic, but as a diagnostic, that, would be, that could be very useful. Yes. Uh, you've told uh, you have to spend time uh, making uh, to parse your common stream. Uh, is it like some plugins there? I just uh, the the question was about what did I have to do to to Wireshark? Um, yes, it was a, um, a plugin that I added to Wireshark, um, and most of it was getting Wireshark to understand the encapsulation of the NVMe and say, 
hey, yeah, this next part is NVMe, and then let it do the, the decode. Are you going to release that plugin that you wrote? Uh, am I going to release that plugin? I absolutely could. It, 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 I, I did some things in the plugin that there are big scary warnings in the Wireshark code that say, please don't ever do this, we'll hate you forever. So um, we have to take care of those. But yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's close. And, and, and actually, I, I think there's, there could be potentially a bigger use case here. I mean, so um, you might even think about, well, is there a way that we could exfil this data from CAM or from the block layer or something like that and actually be able to capture, uh, use that to capture traces. Is there a reviewer commit for the uh, Beehive parts? Is there a, a reviewer commit for the Beehive parts? Um, no. Um, and, and the only reason is I haven't quite figured out how I want to do this. The, the problem is uh, the Beehive emulation code is generously a moving target. Um, so there are enough things that I'm fixing in it um, and enough things that are changing, which is going to make this plugin structure fragile. Um, but one possibility, um, and I'd love some feedback on this, is perhaps I could make a port of this, of just the Beehive portions with the, um, with the plugin code in it uh, and have something that tracks 12 stable and current, maybe. I don't know. Would it make more sense to have it in the tree because everything's moving so much? Um, I, so, that, so that the 12 current stays with the 12 and the 13 stays with the 13 and we MFC fixes to it along with changes you know, that come back? Potentially. Okay. Again, I get a little, I get a little nervous about kind of the, the raw memory access. And maybe this is fine, but I, I haven't thought that through enough and, and could use some feedback from others on whether this is good or bad or maybe doesn't matter. I'm perfectly happy only running it on systems that I don't care about. <laughs> I'm very, I have lab boxes for a reason. I'm just saying uh, a huge use case and actually asking your question from the pub the other night, how would you like to see this is I kind of, um, would like to see uh, emulation of a new uh, vendor ID, probably, for um, the NVMe, or have, have a plugin to tie this into previous CCI. I would like to have a have this all in there, but then also have a plugin that does a new NVMe uh, vendor, uh, and then does a series of the vendor-specific commands that say, cause this to fail, cause this to fail, cause this to fail, cause this to fail, cause this to change and then write a set of Hewitt tests around it that all you need to do is load the plugin, Beehive, and then run QA on top of that Beehive and just say, trigger this opcode and then run this test and see what happens. Does that seem to fit with what you're doing that that would be yep. a good implementation model potentially yep. instead of trying to be on the inside and outside at the same time? Yeah, I think I think that would be a, a really good use case for this. Um, I'm I would like to to make this code available. I'm just trying to figure out the way that will cause the least amount of pain. I'll get you the code. Don't worry. Right, now. I stop worrying. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to share with everybody here in case anybody here had any other ideas. So I think that would be the smoothest way to tie it into both. IFCI and uh, previous GCI for a lot of purposes. I, I had the same immediate thought when you did Mac using a Yes, yes, exactly. I saw them like, oh, program, how often did it just fail with my hand? There are all sorts of ways we could abuse this. And there, and there's probably there there may even be use cases for stacking some of these plugins on top of each other, which which the current framework doesn't support, but I don't think it would be that hard to to add. I mean it's the size of the plugin matter. Can we have a monolithic plugin which gives you know X vendor codes for X situations for, for CI testing? I don't think so. The question was, does the physical size of the plugin matter? I don't think. I can't think of a reason why that would. You know, this is this is a shared object. This is code you're you're loading and running as long as the system has enough memory to support it. I don't see why not. Uh, you could 
currently define it for disks, would it make sense also to find it kind of the thing where we just say that already does it for various transports or serial protocols or I'm thinking if I want to keep like a serial protocol or a you know inject pulse So the, the, the question was whether this could be adapted to other types of hardware to do very similar things so that you could do things like, for example, debug the serial port. I absolutely think it could. Um, it comes down to spending the time to create an emulation. Yeah, I, I think it came up with the high time but a way to try to generalize this so that it could be used for everything. Yep. You're really liking the auto group thing. Sure. <laughs> Any other questions? That's really cool. Thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys.